This lecture will examine the pathophysiology of aortic valve stenosis. At this time, I would like to describe for you the changes that occur in the left ventricle and left atrium in response to aortic valve stenosis. And in this figure, I'm showing, first of all, a normal left ventricle, which has a systolic pressure of 120 and end diastolic pressure of 10. And this is ejecting blood into the aorta, and the aortic pressure is 120 over 80. And note that in a normal heart, the peak systolic pressure in the ventricle is very similar to the, to the systolic pressure in the aorta. And I'm showing the same numbers here just for simplicity in these diagrams. And then here we have the left atrial pressure, which will be essentially the same as the end diastolic pressure in the left ventricle. When the aortic valve leaflets are thickened and calcified, that valve will not open as far during systole. So when that occurs, because there's a high outflow resistance, the ventricle needs to generate much greater pressures in order to eject flow across that high resistance. And so I'm depicting here in this example that the peak systolic pressure might be as high as 200 millimeters of mercury. And because of a slight you know, reduction in the stroke volume, the aortic pressure may be reduced. So I'm just showing in this example it's 110. Well, notice that there is a large gradient now during systole between the left ventricle and the aorta, in this case 90 millimeters of mercury. As the blood is, is impaired in its injection across there, blood backs up into the left ventricle so that the end diastolic volume is trying to become expanded and that leads to an increase in end diastolic pressure in the left ventricle. And because this pressure is elevated, the left atrial pressure also has to become elevated in order to fill the left ventricle during diastole. And then also depicted on this diagram is that in response to aortic valve stenosis, we see a thickening of the ventricular walls. So the ventricular walls become hypertrophied. And we will also see left atria hypertrophy because it is having to contract against a higher left ventricular filling pressure. And so it will um, respond by undergoing remodeling and hypertrophy. So to summarize what happens here in aortic valve stenosis, we have left ventricular concentric hypertrophy, which means that there's a decrease in left ventricular compliance. We're going to have greatly elevated end diastolic pressures and left atrial pressures and left atrial hypertrophy. In order to understand these changes, I need to back up a little bit and have us look at the hemodynamics associated with stenosis. So in my diagram here, I'm just showing that under control conditions, we might have a pressure gradient of two millimeters of mercury during ejection. But here in the stenotic condition, I'm showing now that there might be a pressure gradient across the valve instead of two, it becomes maybe 32 millimeters of mercury. Well, how do we come up with these numbers? Well, we know that the pressure gradient across the valve is proportionate to the flow across the valve times the resistance of the valve opening. And we know that resistance is related to uh, viscosity divided by the, the radius squared of the, of the valve. And because we know that area is proportionate to radius squared, we can now substitute in our pressure gradient formula um, these factors here, and we now can say that the delta P, or the pressure gradient across that valve, is proportionate to the flow rate across that valve, divided by area, valve, surface, valve orifice area, squared. Now, what this means is that if flow were to increase threefold across that valve, which occurs during exercise, that means that the delta P would increase threefold. If you increase this threefold, this will increase threefold. Now, let's look at the valve uh, orifice area. 
If the valve area is reduced to one-fourth its original area, that is a 75% decrease, then delta P increases 16-fold from 2 to 32 millimeters of mercury. And that occurs because the delta P is inversely related to the valve area squared. But there's something else that enters in to the genesis um, of the pressure gradient across the valve, and that is turbulent flow. So we need to compare and contrast laminar versus turbulent flow. Normally, across the valve, you pretty much so have a laminar flow condition, and that's true with most blood vessels in the body. Laminar flow means that you have parallel layers of fluid sliding past each other, and they're, they're traveling in the same linear direction. If you have an obstruction, however, for example, uh, a lesion within a blood vessel that narrows the vessel, or in the case of the valve, you have a narrowed valve opening, we find that laminar flow becomes disruptive and it becomes turbulent flow. Now the layers of fluid are no longer parallel. They're very random and chaotic in direction. And this most commonly results from narrowing of arterial vessels or a valve orifice. Another fundamental concept we need to understand is based upon what we call the continuity equation for flow. This is just a very simple calculation. We know that the flow through a tube, or the flow across a valve for that matter, is equal to the mean velocity of that moving blood times the cross-sectional area. So if flow is, is in milliliters per second, then the velocity would be in so many centimeters per second times the cross-sectional area, which would be centimeters squared. So therefore, therefore flow would be cubic centimeters or milliliters per second. We can, we can rearrange this equation and solve for the mean velocity and see that the mean velocity is equal to the flow divided by the cross-sectional area. So by this above relationship here, if the valve area is reduced to one-fourth its original area, the flow velocity increases fourfold. Now why is this, is this important? Well, it's important because increases in velocity can predispose to the, to the formation of turbulent flow. And let's see how this, how this works. Turbulence occurs under conditions of high flow velocity and can also occur under conditions of reduced blood viscosity. Now velocity and therefore turbulence is increased by reduced valve area or increased flow across the valve. And reduced blood hematocrit reduces viscosity and that can also lead to turbulence. Now let's look at this in a more quantitative way fashion with this graph. What I have plotted here is the pressure gradient, let's say across the valve, uh, as a function of the flow across that valve. If the valve has low resistance, then we will have laminar flow conditions occurring. So we have essentially a linear or Newtonian relationship between the pressure gradient and the flow. But if we have a narrowed valve, because we're going to have much higher velocities, once we achieve a certain flow rate, we might suddenly get a departure from that linearity, such that we get a disproportionate increase in the pressure gradient as we increase the flow. And this would be associated with turbulence. So turbulence causes delta P not to be equal to flow times resistance as we saw a few slides ago, but that the pressure gradient across the valve would be greater than the flow times the resistance. Or for valves, we can substitute in that cross-sectional area of the valve and we can see that the delta P or pressure gradient is greater than the flow divided by the valve area squared.
Now let's look at laminar and turbulent flow sequentially in the heart and see how it affects the pressure gradient. So once again, using uh, the numbers that you saw previously, we'll assume that under normal conditions, we have a very small pressure gradient of two. And now if all we do is reduce the valve sur uh, surface area, the valve orifice area to one fourth, it's normal cross-sectional area. And if we had no turbulence occurring across there, then we would have the delta P equal to 32. It'd be f increased fourfold because, because we had one fourth of the area squared. That means a factor of 16 that delta P will increase by. So this becomes 32. So now the pressure gradient is 152 minus 120 instead of 122 minus 120. But now if we also have turbulence occurring, which we will under this condition, and we, we have one-fourth of valve area, but with turbulence, now this delta P is going to be greater than 32 because we get that departure from linearity between delta P and the flow. And so now we might have a situation where the left ventricular pressure needs to be 170 millimeters of mercury. The aortic pressure may drop down to 110, but now we see that there is a 60 millimeter of mercury gradient across across the valve instead of a 32 millimeter mercury gradient across the valve. The difference between these two is simply the addition of turbulence. Now let's look at pressure changes within the left ventricle and within the left atrium and the genesis of the murmur that is associated with aortic stenosis. So this is our cardiac cycle diagram, left ventricular pressure, aortic pressure, left atrial pressure down below. Recall that normally left ventricular pressure is just slightly above aortic pressure, especially during rapid ejection phase, and then it kind of drops down a little bit. That's how it would normally appear. But if we have a significant aortic stenosis, then this pressure might be 200 millimeters of mercury during systole. And the difference between that left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure is the pressure gradient across that valve. Now, this will cause blood to back up into the left ventricle and into the left atrium. So left ventricular and diastolic pressures will be elevated and also left atrial pressures. It's a little bit difficult to discern that in this particular figure because of the scales, but the left atrial pressure is higher than normal the way I've, I have drawn this here. Well, what about the murmur that is associated with this? Well, murmurs are caused by turbulent flow. And so where, where does the turbulence occur? And when does it occur? Well, it, it occurs when the blood is starting to be ejected into the aorta. Now, initially, the pressure gradient is rather low and it starts to build during ejection. And so the velocity is increasing more and more and we're gonna get more and more turbulence occurring up to a peak level. And so this band here is showing a crescendo and a decrescendo type of murmur. Here is S1. This is where the mitral valve closes. So appearing after the aortic valve opens, so a little bit of time after S1, we have the beginning of the murmur. It will reach a peak, pretty, pretty much so associated with the peak left ventricular pressure. And then as the pressure gradient starts to fall, as the ventricle relaxes, uh, we will have a reduction in the intensity of the murmur, and it will end with S2. Once you have the aortic valve closure, then you will have no more systolic ejection murmur. And how might this look with pressure volume loops? Over here on the right, in the dotted loop, is the normal pressure volume loop. But the loop might look like this for aortic valve stenosis. So we're going to see that when the ventricle contracts and ejects blood, it's going to eject, it's going to have to generate a much higher pressure. So this pressure here, to be consistent with this graph, is the same pressure, 200 millimeters of mercury. That would be the peak systolic pressure of the ventricle. 
and then that pressure starts to fall, then we undergo isovolumetric relaxation, and followed by filling of the ventricle. Well, notice another change, that the filling curve for the ventricle is much steeper. It's much steeper because this ventricle has much less compliance because chronic aortic stenosis results in ventricular hypertrophy. So the ventricle is stiffer, it is less compliant, which means that as the ventricle fills with blood, especially at end diastolic volume, it's going to have a much higher end diastolic pressure than it did without the stenotic lesion. We see that with this loop also, because of this increase in pressure it has to be generated, this comprises a large increase in afterload on the left ventricle, so the end systolic volume is increased. And we may or may not see much of a change in end diastolic volume. It may be reduced to small amount, and it may be pretty normal depending upon how well that ventricle can fill with that um, increased filling pressure that's, that's required because of the stiffer ventricle. So let's just summarize what we've seen in the last several slides regarding aortic stenosis. It is associated with the following. A large systolic pressure gradient across the aortic valve. We also see that systolic, we also see a, a systolic ejection murmur and it will lead to an S4 sound too, as I talked about the other day in the lecture, uh, because you have a stiff ventricle. And so when the atria contract during the first phase of the cardiac cycle, this can set up vibrations within the, uh, the stiff left ventricle and lead to what we call the fourth heart sound. We also see that there's a decrease in stroke volume. The width, the width of the pressure volume loop was, was uh, reduced. There might be a small increase. I mean, I'm sorry, there is, a, there is an increase in the ESV. Uh, the EDV may not change very much, but the ESV certainly, inc certainly increases because of, of a reduced stroke volume. We will see an increase in end diastolic pressure and therefore an increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or left atrial pressure. The ventricle will respond by remodeling and it will develop what we call concentric hypertrophy which represents a decreased left ventricular compliance, and this will result in diastolic dysfunction. So you'll have impaired filling of the left ventricle. There will also be left atrial hypertrophy because it is having to develop much higher pressures to um, uh, eject blood into the left ventricle at the end of the filling phase, the end of diastole. And we will also see a very large increase in myocardial oxygen demand. I'm just stating that now because in a few weeks we'll be talking about this in more detail. But this large increase in wall stress or an afterload on the heart leads to a large increase in myocardial oxygen demand.